Let's all stand together this morning. see all of you this morning. My name's Jimmy Lewis and I get to read this morning. Uh, that's going to be our Psalm 119 verses uh, 1 and 2 and everybody online, I didn't forget you. I'm just a little brain dead. Uh, but I get to read and it's an honor. It's an honor for me to stand up here and just get to read God's word. It's, we're in a blessed nation right now. The world's going crazy. Uh, but God's in control. So we just got to keep that in mind. And starting in verse 1 of uh, uh, Psalm 119, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the ways who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can come to your house. Me with brothers and sisters, Father, and, and walk in your way as much as possible as far as a human. Father, our hearts are chasing you. I know mine is, and I can speak for, I'd say, the vast majority. And we miss our, our brothers and sisters that aren't here, and we just ask that your hand be on them right now, and that you're, you're touching them and you're healing them and taking care of them. Father, again, we just we praise you for the opportunity to come in together and listen to Pastor as he brings us the message that you've given him. Father, again, we just ask that you lift him up, hide him behind the cross, and that Holy Spirit, you've got your way in this whole service today, and if anybody 
in here doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Father, we pray that changes today, right now at this time. And Father, again, we just ask that you watch over us and that you bless this uh, time of worship and we worship you in a worthy manner. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Go ahead and be seated, everybody. It's good to see y'all. I want to welcome you to the worship service this morning here in the sanctuary. Those of you joining us online, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, a few items of church news real quick. First of all, we want to thank everybody that uh, participated in the volleyball tournament yesterday. I want to thank Sean and Amanda Reagan for setting that up for us. Um, that was to help raise funds uh, for the team that's going to go on the mission trip in August to the El Arca Children's Home in the Amazon jungle of Peru. And um, so it was a big success. There was a good turnout. Uh, part of it involved um, a bake sale. There was a lot of homemade baked goods that were for sale, you know, for all the people who came to watch and the participants. And a lot of it did sell, but some of it didn't. And there's a table right out here in the hallway. There's all sorts of good stuff out there. There's brownies. There's cookies. There's um, pumpkin bread. There's homemade sandwich bread. There's all sorts of stuff. And it's all for a donation to help support the mission team that's going to Peru. So you know you need some of it. On your way out, take a look and pick something up, all right? I, I think, Amanda, you'll be out there. Will you be out there? Yeah. She'll, she'll be out there. She'll be happy to take your money. <laughs> um, also, there's some leftover hot dogs and sandwiches, and you've got to eat this afternoon. So maybe you could go out by way of the fellowship hall and grab a hot dog and a sandwich. All right. But it was a good time. And uh, there'll be some more fundraising events coming up here in the months to come as we get that team ready to go down there into the jungle. Um, you know, we really have, God has blessed us with a tremendous church family. Do you know that Oak Hill Baptist Church is a special place for many reasons. Um, and we're just going to have a time of fellowship here in a minute. I'm just going to encourage you to walk around and give somebody a hug. Uh, tell them you love them. Find somebody who might be struggling a little bit and give them a word of encouragement. But uh, we're really blessed to have a, a special church home. And um, thank you for being a part of it. We have one other thing we need to do right now. Mary, why don't you come up? Uh, there's a new ministry that's been started. Uh, it's a quilting ministry. And it's designed specifically to make quilts for those who are suffering. Um, and this one, uh, it, it's a, I'm, I'm going to say it anyway, whether I'm supposed to or not. <laughs> it, this was made by a, a quilting group that Cynthia Stinson is part of. Okay, so um, in any event, this one is uh, for Paul Devaney. And Paul has a, uh, he has brain cancer. Uh, and it's spread quite a bit and it's pretty debilitating. And they're still looking at treatment options. Uh, they're not here today. Paul and Joanne are not here today. They are watching online. And so this was supposed to be a surprise, and now it's not. Um, <laughs> she doesn't but, watch till later. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we're going to pray over this quilt, that this quilt will bring Paul a lot of comfort as he continues to battle this disease. All right, so I'm going to ask you to bow and pray with me. Uh, our Father, we come before you right now on behalf of our brother Paul. And we thank you so much for him and jo uh, jo Joanne. Uh, they're such a blessing to so many people. They've been faithful servants of yours for so many decades of their lives. And right now they're in this valley, Lord. They're going through this deep challenge. Uh, we thank you that we live in the age of medical science when they can deal with these things. And we pray that you would bring all of that to bear on Paul's life. You could heal him miraculously with just a word. Uh, you could bring healing uh, and, and renewed strength through the medical procedures. Whichever way you choose, we're going to give you all the credit for it. But we pray that you would bless them and strengthen them in the middle of this. And we pray that this prayer blanket, this quilt here, uh, will just remind them. It'll be a great symbol of how much they're loved by you and by this church family. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and give somebody a hug. Walk around and say hello to everybody.
All right, everybody, come on back to your seats. We'll continue our song service. Man, there's a lot of energy in here today. All right. We got some birthdays and an anniversary to celebrate this morning. I did want to kind of piggyback onto what Pastor Jim was saying. Uh, during the announcements, you know, we've got a really, really great church family, and um, I know my family appreciates all the prayers and support for my mom, but actually a prayer of praise this morning, um, and I, <laughs> I hesitated to share this, but the Holy Spirit's nagging me about it, but I get migraines, and um, if you know me, you will not be surprised that my migraines are also dramatic. I usually have vision problems and speech issues. I can't function when I get a migraine, and uh, before we were coming out here, I started having some of the vision things, and it would have prevented me from being able to physically see. And so I grabbed my mother-in-law, and I said, I think I'm getting a migraine. We need to pray. I've got to get through this song service at least. Mom's not here. Um, and she took me to the side and prayed with me, and then Pastor Jim prayed for me, and I can see, and there's no sign of a migraine at this point. So, you know, while we're praising God for everything he's doing for us, I just wanted to give him the credit for sustaining me through this song service this morning. So we got a birthday, a special birthday to celebrate. J.C. Cook, where are you at, J.C.? He's hiding. Well, he specifically requested that we wish his daughter, Lou Ray, a happy birthday today. He says she watches every Sunday. Um, so happy birthday, Lou Ray. Her birthday's today. And then coming up this week, we've got Braxton McCrary and Mitchell Powell have birthdays this week. And then... Even though my mother-in-law was very sweet and prayed with me this morning, I wasn't a good daughter-in-law, and I forgot to put their anniversary on the slide, but Mark and Regina have an anniversary today. <laughs> Happy anniversary to them. <laughs> so if everyone will stand with me, let's sing happy birthday and then happy anniversary. congregational hymn we're going to sing I've got peace like a river if you want to follow along Will's laughing I'm not going to tell that story um, if you want to follow along in your hymn it's number 418 I've got peace like a river Number four, To God Be the Glory. This will be our offertory hymn for our ushers. To God Be the Glory.
allows us to be in your house. Father, we take up these tithes and offers again while we're with this action that uh, they will go further your kingdom. Lord, we ask you to be with pastors who are getting ready to come and deliver a message this morning, Father, that not only our ears will be open, but Father, let our hearts be open to hear your word. We ask you all these things in the only name we can ask them in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let's all stand together. I changed uh, the song last night, so the bulletin's not correct, and it is not Beth Malone's fault. She did a fantastic job. <laughs> We're going to do I'm Not Alone.
Father, we just uh, come before you and thank you that that song is so true. We're not alone. Even in the deepest, darkest valleys, you're there with us. Lord, you're there with us in spirit. We sense it internally in our hearts, uh, but you're with us through our brothers and sisters. You manifest your presence, your love, your care and compassion uh, through other Christians. And once again, we just want to pause. As we think about the fact that we're not alone, uh, we want to pause and thank you for placing us in this church family. Uh, We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As the choir is coming down, we'll go ahead and dismiss the children to Children's Church. Um, Miss Beth has something special planned for them over there in the children's room. But uh, as always, uh, parents, if you'd like, you can keep your children with you. And while everybody's getting situated, uh, speaking of Christians and and the the church family supporting each other, um, we do have a a funeral this afternoon, a memorial service at 2 o'clock for Sandy Shaw, Carla Cox's sister. Um, And I know that uh, the family would appreciate you being here, if you can, uh, to support them in this. Uh, It's a tough time. Sandy suffered for years now with Alzheimer's, and the Lord finally took her home. Her daughter, Tanya, faithfully took care of her for years, and now suddenly uh, this focus in Tanya's life of providing all that care for her mom, uh, suddenly there's a big empty hole, and uh, she's struggling with that. So if you're able to be here for that, it's at 2 o'clock And I know that the family would appreciate your support. We're going to continue our study of um, the book of Romans. We're going to be in chapter 12 today. And you know, some very wise but anonymous person once noted, as you see up there on the screen, the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And you know, that's it's funny, but it's true. Uh, you know, we're going to read in a few minutes in Romans chapter 12 uh, that the Apostle Paul calls us to offer our lives up to Jesus as living sacrifices. And what he means is that we're to serve Jesus with our whole lives. Uh, we're to serve others in his name. And we're to do it with nothing held back. And, you know, for many of us, we would at least profess to live our lives that way. Uh, At at the very least, we would profess to want to live our lives that way. And in truth, I I think, you know, we often make a genuine, sincere effort to do that. 
Uh, sometimes we even rededicate our lives and we commit to really live for Jesus. And I think we mean it when we say it. But then we come face to face with the realities of life. You know, we intend to come to church, to Sunday school, worship service, faithfully every Sunday. Uh, and then we wake up one Sunday morning and it's a beautiful, warm, sunny day. And we think about how much fun it would be to go to the lake instead. Or we were out late on Saturday night and now we just want to uh, sleep in. Uh, or we have family events or who knows what. You get the picture. We offer up our Sunday morning faithfulness to the Lord as a living sacrifice, and then the sacrifice crawls off the altar. Maybe the living sacrifice is financial in nature. You know, we made a commitment to be a faithful tither and to give the first 10% of our income to the Lord to help fund His kingdom building work here on earth. Uh, and then the water heater blows out, the car needs new tires. Uh, we really did need that latest version of the coolest new cell phone. And you get the picture. The living sacrifice has crawled off the altar. You know, I could stand here for a long time this morning, you know, just giving example after example of commitments uh, that are made to the Lord uh, and then not kept for a variety of reasons. All of them are living sacrifices that crawled off the altar. As we continue our study of Romans uh, this morning, uh, we're going to come to a transitional point where Paul's going to shift from a focus on doctrine to a focus on practice. In the first 11 chapters of the uh, letter to the Romans, um, it, it was heavily theological. You know, to this point, Paul's been expounding on doctrinal truth. Uh, and to some degree, it's been largely intellectual, even theoretical. But now, for the rest of the letter, Paul's going to get very practical. He's going to take the doctrine, and he's going to apply it to actual life situations. He's going to do it in very practical ways. Now, you know, in reality, there should be no separation between doctrine and practice. Okay, practice flows out of doctrine. Doctrine supports practice. What we believe should determine how we act. Now, unfortunately, though, a lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times it's all too common for us to profess one thing and then to act in a way that's completely inconsistent with what we just professed that we believe. And, and so we make statements about our faith and then we don't follow through by doing what we actually said. Those are living sacrifices that have crawled off the altar. Look, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then I have a question that I'd like you to consider. Um, even, if Je even if Jesus is your Savior, is Jesus also your Lord? And do you live like He's your Lord? And as a matter of fact, let me break that question down into three sub-questions, if you would. And, and here's the first one. Is Jesus really your Lord? And to consider that question, I, we're studying Romans, but I'm going to start us out with the passage from the Gospel of Luke. Um, and this is Luke's chapter 6. And here's what Jesus had to say to his followers, to the crowd that day. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then don't do the things I say? I'll show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. Well, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the water crashed against that house, but couldn't shake it because the house was well built. But the one who hears and does not act well, it's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the river crashed against it, and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was very great. So in this passage here, what Jesus does is he challenges his, his followers, his listeners there, to consider whether or not they're really following him to the point of obeying him. Now, many of them in that crowd, they were following him, to the extent that they were following him around, 
um, you know, that they were touched and they were impressed by his profound teaching. Uh, they were entertained. They were amazed by the miracles. Uh, they sure did enjoy the free bread and fish and wine that he provided on occasions. Uh, so, yeah, they followed him to that extent and for those reasons. But when it actually came to doing the things he was teaching, you know, go and sin no more. Be the peacemakers. Bless those who persecute you. Give all that you have to the poor and then come, follow me. And all the rest. Uh, that's when the excuses started. No. Ah, Jesus, uh, you know, I, I have to go here or there. I have to do this or that. Um, I, I've got these issues to deal with. You don't know how hard it is to be me. You just don't understand. And yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. On and on, excuse after excuse. Have you ever known somebody who was like, you know, the man with a thousand excuses? I mean, he just had an excuse for every occasion. And many of them sounded plausible, uh, but when it's all said and done and the excuses are given, in the end it's always the same. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. You know, I wonder how many times the Lord hears me with my excuses and he's sitting there on the throne thinking, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's just going on and on, Jim. When it's all said and done, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Um, in this parable here, uh, Jesus said that the one who truly does follow him as Lord, that those who really are living sacrifices and they stay on the altar instead of crawling off it, their lives are sound and solid. Their lives are like a house that's built on a firm foundation. He said, but the excuse makers... Well, they end up with shaky, unstable lives. Uh, you know, like a house that's built on a weak foundation. And folks, the reason that's true is because the best life that any of us are ever going to live is the one that's lived right in the center of God's will with Jesus as Lord, not just as Savior. A life like that? A life with Jesus who really is Lord? That's built upon a firm foundation. That's a solid, healthy, fruitful life. Now, let me just offer a, a word of caution about this lesson here. There is a belief system that's being promoted in some segments of Christianity today that's known as lordship salvation. Uh, and it's being promoted in very clever ways and very convincing ways. It's called lordship salvation. And what it is, it's a belief that it's not enough for Jesus to just be your Savior. He also has to be your Lord, or you're not really saved. And as they explain this belief, they'll tell you that if you really are saved, it will be obvious by the way that you live, and if you're not living it, then it's not real. Now, that kind of sounds plausible. It kind of sounds like they might be right. I mean, if you really believe it, then it ought to be evident in how you live, right? But that's awfully close to works salvation. You know, it's like I have to put my faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, and I have to be a good boy, or I'm not saved. Now, I personally do not subscribe to the theory of lordship salvation. All right, I believe that it is possible for a person to make a genuine profession of faith in Jesus Christ and then simply not follow through and live a life of obedience to Christ. You're saved because you really did accept Jesus as Savior. You're just not obediently following Him as Lord. Now, there's a price to pay for that. For one thing, you're not growing spiritually. You know, the fruit of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul talked about, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the stuff that's supposed to be coming more and more a part of who you are as you grow in your relationship with Christ and as you mature spiritually, that ain't happening because you're not following Jesus as Lord. The other thing is you end up with a life like Jesus just described, the one of the weak man who didn't build it on a firm foundation and his life ended up being a wreck. 
If you profess Jesus as Savior and then don't follow Him as Lord, you got fire insurance, yay, good for you, but your life is a wreck. So there's a price to be paid. But don't be sucked in with, by lordship salvation. That's work salvation. So if you hear that being promoted out there, that's what it's about, and that's the problem with it. Right? So anyway, the food for thought here. Uh, the question to consider is, even if Jesus is your Savior, is He also your Lord? Are, are you living in obedience to Him? And then once you've answered that question, if you believe that you really are following Him as Lord, well then here's another question that I, I, I want to ask you that will help you to assess whether or not He really is your Lord, not just your Savior, and to what degree. And, and here it is. Are you all in or are you holding back? Now we'll go over to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters... In view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So, Paul begins this section with the clause, therefore. And, and you know, it's been said that the word therefore is one of the most important and underrated words in the English language. Uh, or in any language for that matter. In, in Hebrew and Greek, they, they have words that communicate the same intent as the English word therefore. The word therefore, it, it's kind of like a hinge on a door that, that allows the door to swing open and it allows for a transition from one space to another. You know, were it not for the hinge, the door would be a wall. It, it wouldn't be a door. It wouldn't allow you to go from where you were to where you need to be. It's the hinge that makes it possible for the door to be that transition. Well, see, that's the purpose of the word therefore. And in this case, therefore serves as a transition from what Paul was talking about in the previous 11 chapters, doctrine, and it brings us to the next thing he's going to discuss with us, practice. And it connects the two providing a smooth transition from one to the other. Doctrine leads to practice. Practice is supported by doctrine. It swings back and forth. So, Paul says, therefore, and then he urges us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, by body... Is he just referring to, you know, my hands and feet, my eyes, my tongue, my thinking, my words? Uh, well, yes and no. Paul's actually using the word body as a symbol or as a metaphor for my whole life. Okay? Now, of course, that would include my hands, my feet, my eyes, my mouth, my thinking, my words. I mean, it would include the things that I think, the words that I speak, the actions that I take. Uh, but more than that, Paul's calling for us to present our entire lives off up to God as a living sacrifice. And, and you know, we should note here that he's calling for a living sacrifice, not a dead one. He, he's not necessarily calling for us here to be martyrs and to die for Jesus. Although, you know, sometimes in rare cases, that is the case. But almost never is it, is, usually it's not. Uh, he's calling us to live for Jesus. You know, the reason Jesus left you here on earth after he saved you, instead of immediately taking you to heaven, is so that you could live for him. Jesus wants you to live for him. And that's what Paul's calling us to do here. He's calling us to take our lives and offer it up as a living sacrifice. And bringing us back to the previous point about whether or not He's your Lord as well as your Savior, your life is supposed to reflect what you profess to believe. Paul says here that it is your true worship. You know, we, we commonly think that we have worshipped if we showed up at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and warmed a pew for an hour. 
Um, and, and, you know, maybe we have. Hopefully we have. I, I pray that you have, in fact, worshipped here this morning. Uh, but that's not the kind of worship that Paul's talking about in this verse. Paul's saying that when you follow Jesus as Lord, when your life is a living sacrifice to Him, a living sacrifice that doesn't keep crawling off the altar, well, then you're worshiping Him with every minute of every day and you're doing it just by the way that you live. And don't miss the fact also that Paul didn't call that just worship. He called it true worship. And what that means is as sincere as your worship here this morning is, it doesn't compare in God's estimation to the worship He receives when you are a living sacrifice. When you are living your whole life as a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything less than a living sacrifice is just going through the motions. If Sunday morning for an hour is all that it is, it's just yada, 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 blah, blah, blah to the ears of God. He wants your life, your whole life. The Old Testament prophet Micah wrote about this in Micah chapter 6. He says, what should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow down before God on high? Should I bring before Him burnt offerings? With year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the offspring of my body for my own sin? No, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. What's he talking about there? He's talking about worshiping God with your whole life. By living a holy life that brings honor to God. See, if our worship consists just of what we do here in this sanctuary for one hour on a Sunday morning, uh, to God it's just empty ritual. No matter how loud you sing, no matter how many sermon notes you take, no matter how much money you put in the offering plate, uh, if if your faith isn't making a meaningful difference Monday through Saturday outside the walls of this sanctuary, it's just going through the motions. See, Paul says in this verse that in light of the incredible mercies that you have received from God, you should now pursue a lifestyle that expresses His love and His grace in every aspect of your life. A true living sacrifice. So the question is, is Jesus really your Lord as well as your Savior? And are you living for Him with nothing held back? And then the third question that Paul makes us consider here is, are you giving in or standing strong? Look at verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Some translations of the Bible uh, use the word world in this verse. It reads, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, This translation and many others uses the word age. Do not be conformed to this age. And and I think that's a better translation. I I think that's what Paul's referring to here. He's saying, do not be conformed to the culture, to the evil spirit of the age. And, you know, that pertains to us as individuals, but it also pertains to us as a community of believers. You know, there are many individual Christians, there are many churches, there are even entire denominations that are giving into the evil spirit of the age. They are being conformed to the evil spirit of the age. You know, I'm personally dealing with somebody right now who's active in a denomination that is making sweeping compromises with respect to morality and sexual ethics. In order to better conform to the cultural trends, to be more appealing to a wider swath of the culture, they openly endorse and celebrate homosexuality. Even in the church, 
performing same-sex weddings, ordaining homosexual ministers, uh, despite the clear biblical teaching on it. They're doing the same thing now with transgender issues, claiming God's blessing on that as well. And then they attempt to justify those stands by engaging in what I call biblical revisionism. They claim that they have discovered new meanings for the Scripture that has been missed by the best Hebrew and Greek scholars for thousands of years now, and which are just now being properly understood by the enlightened progressive leaders in their denomination. And of course, these new and revised understandings, well, they just happen to conveniently support the lifestyles that they're promoting and encouraging. How convenient is that? This is the kind of thing Paul's cautioning us against right here. You see, we can easily give in to the temptation to go along in order to get along. It is so much easier to go along with the cultural tide than it is to stand strong against the cultural tide. It's so much easier to simply tell people what they want to hear than it is to faithfully preach, teach, and promote the Word of God as it's written. So Paul says here, do not conform. He says, do not go along. He says, do not give in. Instead, be transformed. All right, so how do we do that? How do we become transformed in this manner? How do we get to the point that we're strong, that we're confident, that we're unmovable, that we're able to stand against the cultural tide? Well, he tells us. By the renewing of your mind. Under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so, we immerse ourselves in the Word of God. We make sure we know what we believe and why we believe it. You know, it's like that great title from Josh McDowell's classic book for teenagers, Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. Know what you believe and why you believe it. It's a wonderful title, But it's an important truth. Don't check your brains at the door. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. And that truth, by the way, it applies first and foremost to our personal lives. Okay, folks, do not surrender your brain in your personal life. You have control over the things you expose yourself to. All right, you you can make choices about the music you listen to. The movies, the television shows that you watch, the sites you visit on the internet and other other social media, what you read, the kinds of people you associate with. You can choose to fill your mind and your heart with the good things of God. It's like the Apostle Paul taught us in Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Choose these things instead of those other things. So don't check your brain at the door in your personal life. And also, don't check your brain at the door when you go to school or into your workplace. Don't surrender your brain to to teachers or professors or to the cultural mob. Instead, maintain a biblical worldview and compare all of that other stuff to what the Word of God says. Don't even check your brains at the door of the church. Please, do not come in here and allow me or any other preacher, any other teacher... To have unguarded access to your mind. Paul tells us here to be discerning. To think about it. To compare what you're hearing to what you know to be true. How do you do that? Well, I know many of you here, especially those who are faithful in Sunday school, over breakfast on Sunday morning, you're reviewing your Sunday school lesson for that, for that day. And so you come in here already knowing what the lesson's going to be about, and you've been thinking about it, and you're ready to engage and to ask questions and to share insights. Okay? Rather than just accepting what you're hearing, 
you're ready to think about it and wrestle with it and, and ask questions and probe it. Listen to what the preacher is saying. But then think about whether or not it rings true. Compare what you're hearing from me to what the Bible actually says. And make sure you're not being led astray. Make sure you're not being fed some revisionist poison. See, we need to make sure that Jesus is our Lord as well as our Savior. We need to make sure that we're living fully for Him with nothing held back. And we need to make sure that we're not conforming to the culture around us. But rather, we're standing strong. We're standing firm on biblical truth. You know, sometimes the, the, this, this whole business of being a living sacrifice, it can seem pretty intimidating. It can seem pretty overwhelming. We can mistakenly conclude that, you know, Jesus is calling us to make some kind of huge sacrifice, like, you know, selling everything we own, moving to the jungles of Papua New Guinea, and, you know, spending our lives ministering to the pygmies. Um, Actually, he's calling us to something very different. You know, sometimes it is going to be that. But not often. Very rarely. One commentator put it this way. He says, we think giving, all our, giving our all to the Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill, laying it out on the table before the Lord, and saying, here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all to you. Uh, but the reality for most of us is that Jesus sends us to the bank to cash in that $1,000 bill for 4,000 quarters. And then we're to go through life putting out 25 cents here, 50 cents there, spending some time with the struggling teenager being raised by a single mom, serving a meal at a homeless shelter, visiting our sick neighbor in the hospital, going through life not making one grand $1,000 sacrifice but distributing 4,000 quarters as we walk through our days. Making a difference in thousands of small ways all throughout the days and weeks and months and years of our lives. I want to encourage us all here this morning to spend our lives distributing our quarters. Be a living sacrifice, fully following Jesus, making a difference in lives of people, uh, in dozens of small ways, everywhere you go, every day. Okay, that's the faithful follower that Jesus is looking for today. That's the living sacrifice that he's calling us to. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we think about the, the truth of what Paul has taught us here today. And I believe that every person in this place, every person watching online, really does want to be a good and faithful servant. We really do want to live fully for you. And we do know, in our heart, we know that that is the best life we will ever have. The one that is lived right in the center of your will. Uh, we all struggle with this in different ways, Lord. So I pray that you would speak to each one of our minds and hearts right now. Uh, that you would speak to each one of us personally. And show us the areas of our lives that need to be fine-tuned. The areas of our lives that we still need to surrender to you. Uh, Lord, we pray that if there's any here in this sanctuary or listening online that have never made that first move of opening their hearts and accepting you as Savior, uh, we pray that that'll happen today, that today will be the day of salvation for those folks. And we pray it all in your great name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we'll end with the time of invitation. If you've never placed your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you've never accepted Him as Savior, He needs to be your Savior before He can be your Lord. So I encourage you to make that decision today. Uh, I'm going to be standing up here in front as we sing a song. If you'd like to come up and tell me, I'd be happy to pray with you. If you don't have a church home, but you'd like to join Oak Hill Baptist, let me know that. I'll tell you how you could join our church. Uh, if you just have something you want to pray about, Come and kneel at the altar. Go to the foot of the cross. Put a stone there as a symbol of something you're giving to the Lord. Uh, for any of those reasons, why don't you let Jesus have his way in your life today? Let's stand and sing together. Number
Hi, I'm Jim Mercer, the pastor here at Oak Hill Baptist Church, and I want you to know that we appreciate that you took the time to worship with us today. And I pray that you were blessed by the service you participated in and by the message that you heard. And if the Lord spoke to your heart, I'd love to talk to you about that, either regarding salvation or recommitting your life or maybe getting more information about being part of our online church family or for any other issue that you might have going on in your life. If you have questions or if you'd just like to talk or for more information about the church, please use the information on the screen to reach out to us. Again, thank you for joining us online today. And we'd love to have you visit with us in person if you're able, but we'd be happy just to have you continue being part of our online church family. So until next time, from all of us here at Oak Hill Baptist Church in Crossville, Tennessee, and in the words of Moses found in Numbers chapter 6, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. May God bless you.